Well, hello, it's Martin Willis, uh, your host. It's been a while since I've had a podcast uh, about antiques for the Antique Auction Forum. So I'm kind of dusting things off and starting again. And what a great way to start is uh, to talk to my longtime friend, Dan Meter. He's been on the show uh, a couple of times in the past. Uh, But Dan has something kind of exciting to talk about in this show, and that was uh, foraging through an attic in in Amesbury, Massachusetts. Uh, Dan, how are you? Welcome to the show. Hey, Marty. How are you? Thank you for having me. Good, good. Uh, Great to have you uh, back, as always. I'm looking at your picture. It's a great picture of you. It's up on YouTube right now. And by the way, for the listener of this podcast, you can go on uh, antiqueauctionforum.com, and you'll see this video um, if you want to watch through the pictures. But it's pretty funny. There's some Windex behind you. I didn't see that oh, nice. when I found the picture. <laughs> well, we try to keep things clean here. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dan, a uh, pretty exciting auction you're having tomorrow. I want to talk about, um, w- you know, a lot of times in this business, we are excited about this business f- for what we term as the treasure hunt. Um, and you and I have been, actually, you and I have dug through attics together. So, uh uh, we both know what it's like. I've been doing that since I was a little kid. And uh, and how you, much fun is it? <laughs> Tell the truth. It's a blast. <laughs> it, 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 well, it, when you find something, that's exciting. Yeah. And, and you know, I've said this before in the show. It's not always about the value. A lot of people think it's that I talk about being excited and, and, and finding something really rare uh, because of the value. Um, that The value is reflected by the rarity, certainly. But um, mm-hmm. to find something historic unknown, uh, there's really nothing more exciting than that. True, 100% true, yeah. We don't get to do that very often, do we? <laughs> no, no, but it does no. happen. and uh, so It this, does happen, and it just happened just with this estate right now. So, yeah, so let's... Uh, we've been very let's, fortunate. Let's talk about, um, let's talk about what uh, the circumstances were that led up to the find, and then... Uh, well, first of all, uh, spoiler alert, we're talking about an Andy Warhol here, and uh, not just one, a lot of kind of exciting things involved in this. So why don't you, uh, why don't you explain to the listening audience uh, exactly what happened and how you, uh, how you found this piece? Sure. We're here at John McInnes Auctioneers in Amesbury, Massachusetts, and this is where the story actually begins on this particular one. A lot of times we'll get things in there from who knows where, but this one actually happened right in our own, own hometown here. Uh, we were called in to deal with the estate of Harriet Gould, who was a long time, long family, uh, old family of Amesbury. They were, she was Harriet Woodson was her maiden name. And if people are from our area, well, they will know Woodson Farm. It was a, the largest dairy farm in New England with 800 cows. And the city of Amesbury actually owns all that property now, the, the acreage. Uh, and it's used for, for all types of activities. So we were called in. She passed away about a year ago this time. And a few months later, the uh, estate called us in to basically determine what type of value was in there, the contents of the home. So uh, about six months after she passed away, we were brought in, and we started to do a cursory view just to see what would happen. We, we determined that the, the uh, worth would be found out by, the, uh, by holding an auction, so the things would be sold that were found in the estate. So we went in to do a cursory view look to see if it was a traditional auction, if we were going to hold it on site, if we were going to call from the sale, if there weren't too many valuable things, or if uh, what the situation might be. Now, the one catch to this was we did know that there was a connection with the pop art uh, icon uh, Andy Warhol to this family. Uh, Harriet's son was the, uh, a longtime companion actually through the 1980s of Andy Warhol. Her son was John Gould. And there is a known... A quantity of artwork that John Gould had collected. He had bought and collected a massive collection. I shouldn't say massive, but a large collection of uh, pop art from the 80s that Andy helped him put together. Now, that stuff is known that was put together and that was put off into a, a vault somewhere. That had nothing to do with what we were dealing with. We were dealing with her estate and the things that were found in it. So we went in and as you have done yourself, Marty, we go in, we have to just do an overall view. So we're looking around what's in there, the furniture, glassware, china, silver, jewelry, rugs, whatever it might be. So we're looking at it from a traditional standpoint as an old Yankee family. And uh, as time went on, I'm walking upstairs. This is still, uh, 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 let me put it this way, the house was full. There was a lot of stuff in there. Uh, uh, she was a collector, and every inch of the space on the upper floors was, was uh, packed with a lot of different things. 
So I'm up in the attic. I get up there and I start looking around. And there were, as, as like I said, this is a traditional Yankee home, and there's generations of things that are accumulated up in piles up in the attic. So I see this one thing though. It's sticking out at me. It, it, I see a lot of stuff, but there's you know the regular clothing and Christmas stuff. You know the regular things that you find in stuff that's generational that there was no longer needed or used downstairs and brought up there for one reason or another. But I can see this headlines of a crinkled up newspaper, and I'm looking at this newspaper. And it's, I can't really get to it because I, I, had, I needed to make a path to it. So I'm looking at it, but it stood out to me because it was from the 1980s, and it was large, and it seemed stiff. And I'm like, well, I, it didn't make sense to me. There was something about it that was just odd. It was crumpled up, and it looked like you had just unpacked a piece of china or a glassware, and you left a piece of paper next to it. So I get over to it. I, pull it, I pick it up, and I realize it's not even paper. It's aluminum. And I'm looking at it. I'm like, what the heck am I looking at? And it, and it was uh, signed. Uh, to uh, John Andy Warhol, 83. And then I knew right from there that we had a situation on our hands. This is not going to be a traditional old Yankee auction. This is not your grandparents' auction. This is a different type of a sale. And it caused me to realize that I needed to go through the entire place with a fine-tooth comb. It wasn't like I could just see what was out and available for sale. I had to really paw through these things. Now, and, let, me, let me just interrupt you. Let me just yeah. ask you this, Dan, because sure. I've had this happen to me many, many times. Um, and, and I don't even know if you can answer this question, but did the family say anything to you like, Hey, look, if you find anything, a war hole, um, you know, it's not up for grabs or did, was there anything like that that came up in the conversation? No, no, it was said right from the get go, you know, that this was the estate. We had to deal with the estate here. And, um, it was set up in when Harry passed away that the things in the house had to be sold and the house had to be sold. Um, so that's why we were called in. So whatever was in the house, as far as we were concerned, was all part of the estate. Um, and these were things that when John passed away, her son John, uh, he died in 1986, six months prior to Andy. Uh, these things were brought to the house. We found out that he had a house in Beverly Hills, and she basically packed it all up, including all the toiletries, everything that you can imagine, and brought it back to her home in Amesbury. So all the stuff remained there basically in a time capsule for 30 years, because mm. this is uh, 31 years later now. So um, these things, um, I actually brought the uh, uh, piece down from the attic. Uh, one of the family members was there, one of the cousins, I believe. And we talked about it, we left it there, and then one of the heirs, direct heirs, came in uh, the next day, and we showed it to him, and he's like, oh, no, that's fine, you can sell that. So um, uh, that, that was fine. That, it, it, it was just part of the, uh, what we found in there. And it, it was such to the point where the catalyst really led into some very interesting finds that leads to the item that you, the, everybody seems to be talking about. Um, and we, we continued our work. This was basically over the entire summer. I was there for, by the time I found the next piece that we'll talk about, I was there already for about seven weeks, I think. And, again, it's not just the attic. I mean, it was the whole house, so you have to deal with everything. And what we were doing was we were putting things into perspective as far as value, worth, and finding smaller things that were related to the pop culture world. We didn't find just Warhols. We found things that were related to Keith Herring, Kenny Scharf, John michel Basquiat. Um, we found, you know, various things that were just, you know, pretty important in our eyes, especially finding them up here in 35 miles north of Boston, you know, in, in a rural area near the Atlantic Ocean is just not where you normally find this 1980s pop art culture. Right. So the next item that I found after I had been there that we need to talk about is this piece that I was up there on a really hot day in the, up in the attic, and I, I'm on my hands and knees, and I'm going through all kinds of stuff. And then I, I get down through this level of boxes, one on top of the other. And at this point, I had already found some major things that, that were great and all, but I figured I was already done, that I wasn't going to find anything else. So I'm going through these scarves. There's a plastic bag, and it's full of scarves. I'm looking for Hermé or anything that I might find that might be of more value that would relate to anything that we're doing. And underneath that, I find this bubble wrap, and in it is this piece that I open up into that is... I'm trying to figure it out. I'm looking at it, and it's this painting that is a canvas that is broken, and it's formed, and it's on purpose. And I'm like, what the heck is this thing? You know, I'm trying to figure it out. So I'm turning it this way and that way, trying to figure out the perspective that I'm supposed to be viewing this thing at, because it, it, it showed uh, uh, colors and schemes and dots and things like that that I just didn't quite understand. And I couldn't place it with a specific artist or anything. I'm just looking at this, and there's no writing on the front. And then finally, I turn the thing over, and then I start, I, I realize that there's a whole inscription on the back. And I start to, to shake, and I'm like, I can't even believe what I found here. Um, it, it was uh, signed 
uh, John Andy Warhol, 83. And uh, when you understand the provenance and w- what, what this means in the mind of Andy Warhol, the man that crafted this, and what it meant in relationship to the person that he made it for, John Gould was considered his muse. John Gould, what he, he was infatuated with John. He loved John, and it was a, a situation that is all documented, you know, through his diary, through other books, passages, all about this relationship. And this, this really spoke volumes. When you looked at this piece, are you showing it now? Do you yes, see I am. Yeah, it? it's up on okay, the screen. So, so if you look at this piece, you can see what I've been talking about. It is very difficult to understand if you don't understand the backstory. Yeah. So it is, it is a... It was a brand new canvas that was on stretchers. He took this and he physically, you know, forcefully broke this. He formed it, made it into this three-dimensional sculpture, and at the same time he painted it deliberately in the fashion that he saw that he, that he wanted to project. And then he gives it to his companion. And so we're, we're looking at this and we're saying, well, what the heck, you know, really, it's a very powerful piece when you think about the, the effort that went into it to, to form this thing and to give it to his, his, his muse. And I, I just, I, I can't, well, I, I would put it this way. When you look at this piece and then you understand the first piece that I found that I just spoke about, the headlines, the aluminum, that was a sculpture as well. And that was a very forceful piece too. That was a crumpled, it was crumpled, it had little tiny tears. It was a really uh, um, uh, aggressive work. And then you look at this piece that I just found, and this is totally aggressive as well. Now, when you understand this relationship between John and Andy, it was a very complex one. I mean, there was a lot of different things going on in it. It was uh, really an infatuation by Andy, and there was this line, this drawn line that John always seemed to give to Andy that, that uh, he couldn't break through sometimes. And I think there was a lot of frustration in Andy's, in Andy's in his mind. So when he's making these things, and you think about these two things together, it's really a, a statement, a statement of this love, this power, this, this companionship that, you know, that is all documented and written about. So uh, I'm looking at these, and I'm thinking about something that I also found that was, was some copies of poetry that John had written to Andy. He would pull a page out of a New Yorker magazine and he'd write these lines. And they'd be beautiful little lines. And he would send them to Andy. And if you had a companion that sent you these notes, these poems, you would be so happy. I mean, they're just restful, they're calming, and they make you feel really good. So it was not a one-way street. I mean, John had these very, very strong feelings. He moved in with Andy. They were, they were together. They had, he had his own room at Andy's place. And uh, they were together all the time. So when you see these words and you see these things, it's what is so great is that this brings out a different dimension, a different side that really is not that well known. All the words from Andy are known through his diary. All of the contemporaries, the circles that have written about him, those are all from other points of view. But what we're seeing here is the John side of it. So it's pretty, it's pretty fascinating, you know, to, to for us to find these things. And basically, they're unknown. You know, they're, they're, it's an atypical work. This this one abstraction. You know, there, there's nothing like this. Uh, like I said, when I first looked at it, yeah, I would not put it with Andy Warhol. You wouldn't look at it and say, you know, uh, this is his type of work. You know, we're all used to his iconic figures of the Marilyn Monroe's and Elvis's and the uh, electric chair and all those kind of things that, that he did that, that are so uh, uh, common in our, our, our minds. But right. this, is, this is out there. Yeah, I think uh, when I first uh, I was at the gallery yesterday, and when I first uh, walked in and, you know, saw the piece, I thought, wow, you know, if I went to an estate sale or yard sale or something like that. And I saw that. <clears throat> I might walk up to it out of curiosity, but most likely... Well, it I'd, is a curious thing. It is yeah. a curious. But exactly like you're saying, who, who, you know, what is it all about? If you didn't understand the backstory, you didn't know, you know, this provenance. And this is, it's such a, it's, it's such a uh, perfect provenance, you know, to have something right. that represents this love and this companionship. It's just, it's just you know, mind-blowing. Now, I know the auction's tomorrow, and... Uh, mm-hmm. You probably have no idea what something like this particular piece uh, might exactly. sell for, I mean, it's because a, it's, it's atypical. A, right, right. I mean, you're a appraiser yourself, and you have to go in, and we look at other past sales of things that go for. Now, you look at, I just mentioned, like the Elvises and the Maryland's, and all, those are all exact sciences. We yeah. know that those are basically commodities. They're very valuable, and they go for a certain price. Yes, they go high. Yes, they go low. But in this particular case, all we could base it on was, okay, look, 
We know that Andy goes for thousands of dollars, his works that are original, that are, that are, that are nice. And they go up to a record of $105 million. So we have a range of $105 million all the way down to low thousands. So there is no way that you could you know, find anything that's similar, find anything that's a totally unique piece. So we just put down an estimate of 500 to a $1 million. So what does that mean? You know, Five, we have five hundred thousand to a million. Five hundred thousand to a million dollars mm-hmm. is what we put it down for because when we look at it and we say, okay, we have an unreserved sale. This is an unreserved auction. Things are going to sell for whatever they're worth. That's the beauty of an auction is the public will determine what this is worth on the day of the sale. So you put it in, you put it down for an estimate. We're on a couple of different platforms when we have this type of auction. This live auction is an invaluable. And that enables any of y'all listeners, anyone with the capability of using a computer or a cell phone, to be able to bid wherever they are on this planet. Uh, and bid at this auction. And when we use those platforms, they require us to have a low estimate and a high estimate. So yeah. we have to put down something. So we put right. down this. We said, well, what are we going to put it down for? So we just tried it. We said, we'll put it down for that. And all of the scholars and the people that we've been talking to that have been talking about this, this not, not one person can say one word. They're all like, well, hey, we're going to find out what it's worth. That's what it's all about. You know. So right. uh, anyone that knows our auctions know that we tend to have uh, a very uh, reasonable estimates, very low sometimes, because we want to engage the public. It's a real thing. It's going to sell. It's going to go for whatever it's worth. So we try to keep that in mind in everything that we do. But in this particular case, you know, this is a real thing. This is a real deal, and it's the type of thing that we've had many people say, geez, wouldn't this be great if you could have this one or even both of those, these two items together, to be able to tell this story that's basically an unknown story. It's not that it's completely unknown because it's out there, but it's just a different side of the story. Yeah. And to show that emotion, you know, it's a, when you really think when you look at these two things and, and you say, geez, what's going on? And when... They hire an auction company like, you know, we're a small, we're a boutique auction house, and we do things in a different manner than other auction houses in that we're able to put things together with the story, you know, because it's all right here. It's all right. Yeah. It, it's in Andy's words, and it's all right there. We can put these things together, and it brings it to life. So right. that's, that's what yeah. we're doing here, and that's why we don't know what it's going to bring. It could sell for 200000 could sell for 300000 could sell for t- two mi- a million. I don't know. We'll, yeah, there's... We'll see what happens. You know, it's so funny. I, I was uh, I was doing an appraisal down uh, uh, Sudbury, Massachusetts, down along the coast, and I was in a house where they had um, their son was a, a very well known uh, uh, contemporary artist in Germany, and uh, they say, "Hey, did you hear about the Warhol found in an attic?" And I didn't. Even, <laughs> and they said, "We think it's going to bring ten million. Yeah, and you know, so speculation. <laughs> Oh, it's really? out there, but I, I <laughs> little did you know where it came from. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, I had no idea until all of a sudden I opened oh, the paper. Funny. And uh, anyway, um, what type of uh, what type of person would buy this? Uh, do you think it would be well, like? And and just going back to what you just said about the story, um, you know, a story is so important. I th- I don't think enough people realize um, how important a story is to value. Um, mm-hmm. And once it loses that story. I encourage people that know a lot about their pieces to, you know, make notes, put them on the back or whatever, right, you right. know, just... We love that. We love that. When we go right. to a home, you find it yourself, and it's like, oh, and that gives... And it's not like you started the show. It's not about the value sometimes, because it could be the most typical common thing, but because it has the story behind it, it brings it to a new life or new dimension, you know, and whether it's a personal one or if it's something of national or international importance depends on the, the level of what it is, of course. But, you know, when you know these things, it brings it to life in it. And it's a personal, it happens in all of our lives, in your life and my life. It's like there's something that you'll look at and it's going to remind you of your grandmother, your aunt, or whoever it might be. Right. But it's that one particular thing and it could be just the most uh, innocent thing of all. So now, who do you right. think is exactly going right. to? Who do you think the the buyer is going to be? A, just if you had to guess. Who, well, I know who I would want to have it. I can tell you that. I would rather have a museum have these pieces and have it be able to tell the story. Of you know, I think that you know when you understand, John passed away at thirty three years old. He started out you know uh, from uh, humble beginnings here, from from an, an old Yankee family, working his way through. Outside Magazine, Rolling Stone Magazine, into being a vice president in Paramount Pictures and passing away at 33 years old. He was working with Barry Diller, Michael Eisner, uh, Frank Mancuso, all these people that we know in the movie industry way back then, and he was a vice president and a producer. I mean, it's incredible Amazing. at 33 years old to have wow. accomplished all of this and then to pass away. Wow. So to yeah. be able to tell the story 
um, is is really an incredible thing, you know, for somebody that lived such a short life and accomplished so much. Um, and to have this part of this iconic inner circle of the pop art culture of New York in the 1980s, it's just, it's incredible. You remember, he was friends with all of Andy's friends, as in, like, Liza Minnelli, Halston, and all, all the names that you would see at Studio 54 and Arena, and all the all the places that they would go together. Um, they, Like I had mentioned, John Michel Basquiat. We found three John Michel Basquiat's in the house. Keith Herring. We actually found his uh, phone book, with his personal phone book, his Hermes phone book, and in there, all, the list of all the names and phone numbers, and Keith Herring, uh, even Steve Rebell, the guy that ran Studio 54, all these names in there. It was like a who's who of 1980s uh, New York, the culture scene. Wow. So, you know, this Popeye culture scene. Right. So when you think about that and what he was involved in, and a lot of those people are gone today. You know, that was the time when, you know, the, 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 the AIDS crisis was really prevalent, and a lot of these people lost yeah. their lives through that or from other sources. A lot of these people are gone. So um, to be able to bring this back and to show it in this light, I think, is really, really fantastic. Now, what? what so I, was, like I said, I, I hope that it goes to a museum. I, I don't know who would buy. I mean, yeah. there are certainly many, many collectors out there that you know have an affinity for this, and they may may want that. And it's the opportunity. We don't know what it's going to sell for. So if it sells very reasonably at a lower price, this is an opportunity for someone to actually own a handmade. This is not a silk screen. This is a handmade object. Uh, painting of by Andy Warhol, and actually some of the scholars have been telling me today that they believe it's the last sculpture that he ever made, which is, you know, wow. a week ago, I mean a month ago, we sold the world's largest piece of American brilliant cut glass that was ever made, and now we're finding the last <laughs> <laughs> sculpture that Andy Warhol ever made. It's really incredible for a small auction house like us to be able to find these things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so when something is, uh, you know, you think of, uh, well, I think of Andy Warhol as a really great self-promoter, a commercial artist, oh, positive, um, yeah. and that just uh, really, you know, made a splash. He used to actually stay right up the road from my house on Atlantic Ave um, years ago, and everyone kind of knew when he was in town. I never saw him, but everyone mm-hmm. knew when he was there, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, well, that's the thing. What we've been able to show here at this auction through, the, through our finds is this personal side that brings him into this Yankee culture. Because he would come up here, he would have East... I found uh, a photograph, and it's Andy sitting out on the back deck at the house here in Amesbury. And I'm looking at it, and that's all well and good. I can see Harriet, uh, John Gould's mother, and then there's a friend of the family sitting next to Andy. And I'm looking, and then I noticed what they're sitting in, and I realized I have the chairs. I found the chairs in the house. There's a set of four yellowish Hitchcock chairs. And that's all well and good, so it's great. You can put the chairs with the photograph. But then, when you read Andy's diary... I'm looking through it, and I read it. I've read it four times now. And in on April 22nd, 1984, they talk about his trip up here to New Hampshire, and he would stay in New Hampshire, and, and he would be with John Gould. And it, it was Easter Sunday, April 22nd, 1984, and he says, and then we went to John Gould's house. We had Easter dinner out on the back lawn, on the back deck, rather. And and here we have the photograph of that. We have the chairs. I'm able to put it in the words of Andy, written in it, and and uh, it just brings it like a new dimension that you couldn't get in another way. I mean, if we just had the chairs, they would be worth nothing. They'd be worth a hundred bucks or something like that. No big deal. But when you can put that with, you know, the idea, the thought of people, a lot of people that are into the art culture, they'll, they'll have a, a, a student or a, a child that, that is a prodigy or whatever. It's like they like to have something that reminds them or brings them. So if you could have a chair that Andy Warhol sat in, so to, to the, in that case, it brings it to such a, it'd be wonderful to be able to say my daughter or my son is an artist. I want him to be able to know or sit in this chair and feel the closeness that, that this icon was here. And, and, you know, to be able to do that is, it's just pretty, you know, incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, what is, uh, I wanted to ask you, what are what some of the things or something really interesting that you learned? I, I know myself when I'm doing research, um, you learn, it sounds like you learned some things through reading the diary. What did you learn about Andy Warhol? Well, I've learned an awful lot. I mean, you know, growing up, you know, I, I grew up in the 70s and the and I was in college in the late 70s, early 80s. And, you know, you knew Andy Warhol already. You'd know him as the, he was always in the news for doing something or being at the right place at the right time or being at a party, that kind of thing. So we all knew the iconic Andy and his eccentricities, that kind of thing. But what I learned is that he was a real person, you know, and I've learned that in a lot of ways in dealing with a lot of the Kennedy things and all the other things that we've done in the past, 
these are real people. They're not just looking at it from afar, thinking, okay, you know, th- this is this is an icon, or this is the, he's totally out there in, in in his own art world. He was a real person, and we I, I was able to see in some snapshots in some of the writings and things like that that he was a, a, a real person with. And, and these people have feelings, and they have, they they you know they always say, oh, Andy didn't feel this, he didn't feel that. Well, guess what? He did. You know, he's just like you. He's just like me in a different way. But yes, he's he's a real person that that had his own feelings. And, I, and that, to me, when I can see that and I can feel the person that that is uh, not this icon that you know from afar. You know, he was in our lifetime, so we knew who he was and all. But uh, it's not like we're looking back at somebody that had passed away or something like that, and we're thinking about it in a different term. So it it to me that's the most uh, fascinating thing to see it in real life, knowing that, you know, just like everyone else, if you celebrate Easter, he was having Easter dinner just like you would be having, and he's right down the street from you. You know what I mean? Right. To me, that, that was fascinating. And the other thing that I, I kind of learned was in his artwork, you know, he, he, uh, he was a master at being able to sell paintings. And, yeah, they were silk screens. You know, people say, well, are they paintings? Are they not paintings? You know, but they, he's lucky. He's able to call them paintings. And he would do more than one. He would do six Liza Minnelli's, a four mile, or however Marilyn Monroe's. Each one would be different because of the colors that he would use on them and the silk screen process. But when you look at that and you see the amount of work that he actually handed, I didn't realize that he didn't do that much hand work. You know, I always thought of it as, though, you know, you think of a painting as a painting and it's all done by hand. Well, he would trace out, he'd take a Polaroid or a snapshot, blow it up on a screen, then trace it out. and then. But a lot of that was mechanical, you know, or he would have staff doing these things. And I didn't realize that he didn't do that much stuff by hand later in life. He was a master of being able to almost mass produce his works and have so many things out there. And that's how he was able to have, afford the lifestyle that he uh, was able to, you know, to own these buildings in New York and be able to uh, live the lifestyle of going and doing what he wanted to. You know, he was very successful in his own lifetime, you know, which is very hard for an artist. Mm-hmm. So he, he uh, right. did that in more of a manufactured way where the things that we found, you know, it's so great to know that these were actually physically made by him, you know, that, and that's so great at knowing that he didn't do that much of it, you know. Yeah. Um, now, what, what do you what do you think the state of pop art uh, from the eighties? What's I know well, it's you know very very hot right now. It's very hot. It's very hot. Yeah. It's very hot. John Michelle Basquiat just he broke Andy's record by five million uh, this year. Amazing. So he's one hundred and ten million dollars for uh, he broke Andy's record by five million, and he's extremely hot. When people found out that we had Basquiat, uh, we have two. Uh, glass vases that he painted and he gave to John with his you know, kind of traditional faces that John Basquiat always did. Mm-hmm. So we have two of those, and we have a thermos that he painted John on and put his initials on. Um, and so to that alone, you know, people say, what do you mean, you found three Basquiat's? <laughs> you like, are you serious? You know, and it's like, when, as soon as people heard that, they were like, oh, my God, because he's even becoming more popular than Andy. You know, and really? uh, wow. yeah, he he died a year after Andy did. He died in '88. So you know that '80s culture um, is still, and the Keith Haring. You know, Keith Haring is so sought after. So right. uh, the pulp pop art, this uh, it's definitely it's it's really thriving. You know, it's really thriving. There's a lot of interest. Now, uh, will just, it stay like that forever? I don't know. But yeah, right I, now. Uh, so that leads me to this: who who's who's Andy Warhol today? Is there anyone like him out there? Hmm. You know that we were talking about this the other day, me and some other people, and we're like, think of all the artists that you know, and how many of them do you actually really know what they even look like? You, you, you know, you think about Andy Warhol, and you think of an artist, and that as soon as you see him, you know who it is. All right, yeah. you, he had that distinct character, that wig, the platinum wig, white. Yeah. So it's like you think of that, and that's what I would put it into context with. Is like, okay. Yeah, we know what Norman Rockwell looks like, and we know all those type of things. But when you look at an artist today, how many of them do you actually know that would have that same presence? And it's not just his work. You know, if you look at Coons or any of these people today that are so big, do you actually even know what they look like? He was a personality as, and an artist at the same time. And is there anybody like that? You tell me. I, really, you know, think about it yeah. that way. Is there somebody that has that same recognition, recognizable character as himself? He was a work of art himself. You know, definitely, and, and I can't think of anybody that is uh, that distinct, that notable. You know, I, I really can't. I remember seeing him in a movie back. I don't even know. I, I want to say it was a. It was actually like a comedy. 60s. He had like a little cameo appearance when I was just a kid. I remember seeing him, and 
But well, it, he 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 with Paul Morris, he did a number of films. They did the Empire State Building and the guy sleeping and all that stuff. But that was way back, and you're not that old. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, he was on the Love Boat. He was on the Love Boat during the relationship with John Gould. Love um, and that was a big deal at the time. He was on Saturday Night Live. He had little TV shows. We actually have a tape of he had the Andy Warhol TV in New York on New York Manhattan Cable, uh, and he that. did a series of those. He had did done he had done series on MTV. He was in the. Uh, uh, one of the music videos, I think it was The Cars or something. Um, uh, I forget which one it was. But that was a famous, you know, at the time MTV was really hot with music videos, and he was in that. So yeah. he was around. He was in a lot of different things. But he was such a character, you know. He 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 he, uh, he knew how to keep himself relevant, and that's what he was doing with John, John Michel, Basquiat, with Keith Haring. Those guys were up and coming, and he knew that he needed to be with those. He stayed relevant for so many decades, you know, and that's how he was able to do it. Yeah. Keeping up with the uh, uh, Joneses, I could suppose. You know, he was always in the right place at the right time with the right crowd. He always made sure he knew who was in town uh, and to who, who to that. hang out with. Yeah. All right. So for the listener, um, the prices realized. I'm going to actually put them in the text um, on YouTube and also on the uh, podcast page. Dan, as always, it's always a lot of fun. Uh, always a lot of fun speaking with you. Okay, it's been great, Mike. And don't forget the auctions tomorrow. And anyone, if you have the internet capabilities, you can go to mckinnisauctions.com and check our website. You'll find a link that will get you to be able to bid from wherever you are in the world. And uh, the auction starts at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So uh, there's plenty of time to look at it. There's a lot of stuff. It's not just Warhol stuff. There's a lot of stuff in there that you might find uh, intriguing and inter- interesting and maybe even want to place a bid. And just as a time stamp, that is December 2nd, 2nd. 2017. December 2nd, 2017. That's All right. right. All right. You have a good one. All right. Thanks, Marty. All right. All right, everyone. So that's it for this show. And uh, hopefully I'll be back, you know, with some other shows. I'm actually have, uh, I've actually has, have a call in to uh, someone to talk about the uh, recent uh, uh, Da Vinci that sold for $450 million. That will be an exciting show if I can uh, speak to an expert about what happened there. All right. Uh, thanks for listening.